Hello and welcome to So What You're Saying Is, I'm Peter Whittle. Now, my guest this week is one of Britain's best-known Conservative commentators. Tim Montgomery was founder of the Conservative Home website. Before that, he was co-founder of the Centre for Social Justice. He has worked right at the very heart of the British political establishment. He was columnist for The Times, and most recently he was editor of the Unheard commentary site. That is really some CV there, Tim. Although I'm not, not sure, given the uh, health and the status of the British political establishment, to be described as <laughs> someone who's been at the heart of it, I'm not sure that was a kind <laughs> thing to say, Peter. Oh, well, no. I'm, Tim, we, we first met each other, um, it, it must be now about 12 years ago, mm. and there was something, a venture called 18 Doughty Street. I mean, can you explain a bit what that was, actually? Because you were, that was your baby, wasn't it? I was certainly involved in it and yeah. it was of course where we first really came across each other yeah. and I think it was an initiative ahead of its time really. I mm -hmm. think it was the idea behind it was that uh, the mainstream media conversation at that time had all the signs of the problems we're now all too familiar with and we wanted to create something and you know we took the advantage of the fact that the number of the house that we were based in was 18 and we yeah. called it politics for adults yeah. and we had the uh, 18 sign as it was another like uh, cinema certification and what we wanted was grown up extended conversation rather than the soundbite yes. yeah. narrow conversations that are too, were too dominant then and still too dominant now but you ran a fantastic culture program yeah i yeah. remember with Very the new fun, culture though, forum but i think uh, internet speeds was too slow then yeah. people didn't have the bandwidth and so what we were trying to broadcast was just hard for people to consume on a on a technical level as much yeah. as anything and it, it unfortunately didn't quite last but it was actually before its time wasn't it really yeah I mean we didn't have YouTube then if I, if I remember that was the big difference did we have YouTube then? I think it might have sort of been emerging but it wasn't emerging. sort of mainstream yeah, yeah. but uh, I can't quite remember yeah. but no I don't think it was a big thing but uh, coming right up to date here, I mean, we can't really uh, get away from it. Obviously, we're recording this at the end of what the first really intense week, if you like, of the Tory leadership yep. campaign. It's something that you would, by, by matter of course, be commenting on. Mm. Um, I wonder, when you view it, are you viewing it as a commentator or do you have a dog in this fight, as it were? Well, uh, I love the Conservative Party. That may sound an odd thing to say, but I really some of my most my first political memories were um well actually it was a school teacher yeah. uh, who told um, me at school that military that nuclear weapons were horrible things yeah. and that we should be ashamed of them and i went home to my dad who was a uh, in the army and told him how ashamed i was of him yeah. and uh, he introduced me to the idea of nuclear deterrence and i went back to my teacher the next day <laughs> hand up and and there on, I saw this lady on the television with her big hair and a, a blue suit and a handbag. And I sort of fell in love with her a bit. And that for me was the Conservative Party at its best. I thought the Conservative Party rescued Britain from a post-war malaise. And I think throughout its history, whether you look at Churchill or other its great leaders and Wilberforce and Shaftesbury as Conservative politicians, I think the Conservative Party has played an important role in the life of this nation and at the moment it's a sick institution it's failed to deliver brexit theresa may has been a disastrous prime minister and i'm just grateful that we have an opportunity for a new leader start to get it right and i hope that somehow uh, that great decision that the british people took in june 2016 will finally be delivered properly by a new prime minister so i'm fascinated by it i'm involved by it i'm uh, worried and hopeful in equal measure but it it really matters and um, I think we probably know who's going to win now Boris Johnson mm. but uh, uh, there is a history of front runners not succeeding and so no, no chickens should be counted yet. How many uh, leadership contests have you actually as it were commented on or been involved with in some way? It's a well, lot isn't it now? Quite a few and at the website that uh, you mentioned Conservative Home that really took off because of the leadership contest yeah, between yeah. David Cameron yeah. and, and David Davis. Uh, we uh, were the first sort of website to do the, MP, the tracker of MPs at that time, which MPs were backing who and how many. And we tried to, I think probably one of the things I'm most proud of in my time in politics and public life was, I don't know if you remember, but Michael Howard uh, 
uh, try to take the vote away from individual party members That's and to yeah. make it a decision mm. only of MPs. Mm. And actually, I thought, well, the people who day in, day out volunteer for the party uh, without hope of reward should continue to have a say in choosing who, is le who, who leads their party. And so, uh, le yeah, I've got a fondness for, for leadership elections because they were quite good for my... Uh, for my career and earnings as well as everything else. Because the, the Conservative Home website, it seemed to me at the time, sort of really in a way, well you, you might disagree with this, but sort of replaced in a way, it, or rather it was the voice, it was meant to be the voice of the grassroots of the Tory party, wasn't mm. it? And I just remember at that time, uh, when I was getting re-involved in politics, that um, there was, it was the time of the Notting Hill Tories, or maybe that was just That's a right, bit before, yep. Yep. and I got the feeling that they were sort of rather ashamed of their own members. I remember having that feeling that they would rather they weren't there. Do you think that that was justified? Do you think? That well, um, th there is this view, and it's still alive today, that uh, Tory members are sort of right wing bigots. And the idea that these people, and they're all old, etc., one of the yes, worst sins yeah. you can commit now, it seems to be old, um, mm. and that they were, and they shouldn't really have the say in the future of the country that they do. But actually, if you look, uh, Marcus Roberts, who is a, uh, a Labour supporter, a pollster, was saying to me recently, he thinks that if you compare the record of Tory and Labour local associations in the selection of candidates in open meetings, Tory members are more likely to select ethnic minority candidates yeah. and more likely to select openly gay people yeah. than the Labour Party. Yeah. And you know these people aren't just old right-wing Tories. They're they're grands, they're granddads, they're they're military veterans, they're community volunteers. You know these are people absolutely embedded in their in their society, and they are in politics because of belief and principle and patriotism. And most MPs, I think, are as well. But MPs, of course, also have a job and a reward out of this. And yeah, I think yeah. um, I think we have a nice balance now in the Conservative Party in our way we choose our leader, between MPs choosing the, you know, the two that go to the country and then the party in the country choosing uh, between those two. But Conservative Home and the internet, has, well, the internet has lots of problems, we're all familiar with them. Yeah. But what Conservative Home is, was part of and still part of is a decentralisation of power from the centre. Mm -hmm. No longer was it just journalists in Westminster deciding what to present as the picture of the grassroots. Yeah. We now have our own place where yeah. we congregate and say what we want. And we've been doing it now for 15 years, and I'm very proud it's, it's still going. You mentioned there at the very beginning that someone who inspired you was this lady you saw on television with blonde hair and blue dress, whatever, and a <laughs> handbag, presumably, as well. Uh, what do you think she would make of this contest at the moment? Do you think she'd have a... Who would she go for, do you think? Oh, that's a question and a <laughs> that's a question and a half. Well, look, I'm biased, um, uh, Peter, and uh, uh, I think we're recording this conversation on a Friday. I think it's a couple of days before yeah, it yeah. goes out, and so events may even take overtake what I'm about right, to okay. say. But uh, I was at university with Sajid Javid, right. who's the British Home Secretary, mm -hmm. and we've been friends for thirty years. I after we left university, we moved into a flat together. And I know him to be a man of enormous integrity and deep concerted conviction. And uh, I know he's a concern. I don't believe in identity politics. Um, he's fundamentally, for me, a sound conservative. But Mrs. Thatcher, you know, she broke through uh, the barrier of becoming Britain's mm. first uh, female prime minister. The Tory party, for all of the accusations that the left throws at it of somehow being a backward looking party, it had the first Jewish leader and prime minister, the first female prime minister, the second female prime minister. Uh, Sajid Javid is the first uh, Asian Briton to hold one of the great offices of state. And uh, I think Mrs. Thatcher might quite like the story of this guy right. who's risen from nothing, uh, son of a Pakistan bus driver, and risen to the top of society. And he's of Muslim background, but he's probably the staunchest defender of Israel in the cabinet. I think he's a, a remarkable man. And so I'd have to say Margaret Thatcher would choose him because oh, right. okay. <laughs> um, I'm choosing him. But whether she would or not, I don't know. Do you think, what would she make of, you, you said the Conservative Party is, is a sick institution at the moment. Mm. Um, what do you think, would she despair, do you think, if she were around now? I think she'd be furious, just as I think grassroots members are 
are furious. Mm. Um, I I left the Conservative Party briefly when David Cameron came back with his deal from Brussels when he said he'd renegotiated our relationship uh, with Britain on a uh, in a fundamental ways. And for me, it was only a cosmetic. Mm -hmm. I, know, really, I know you agree mm -hmm. uh, with that. And I resigned at that point because I was so angry at the insult to intelligence. It was my protest. And then when Theresa May became leader and said Brexit means Brexit and all those, and said she was going to make, it was going to implement the referendum result, I, I rejoined. Mm. I'm still not to this day sure which is the worst decision, leaving or, <laughs> <laughs> leaving or rejoining. Yeah. Um, but it was the most important vote of British post-war history, in my mm. view, the decision to, mm. to leave the European Union. Mm. And the fact that the Conservative Party has messed it up. Mm. Theresa May definitely is an awful Prime Minister, but the Cabinet sat round that table, uh, acquiescing in most of the bad decisions that she made, and there's a contest for how many bad decisions she made. She appointed a Chancellor who is a do-nothing Chancellor at a time when lots of people voted to leave the European Union, but also a fundamental yeah. reset of public policy. The Conservative Party has done very little. She promised to tackle the injustice of her time uh, when um, she stood on the steps of Downing Street on her first day in the office. She hasn't done anything like, and really begun to do it. And Mrs Thatcher was not, I think, the politician that some people remember. She left the NHS untouched. She left much of the welfare state mm. untouched. She was quite pragmatic. Mm. But the things that she said she would do, like tame the unions, like control inflation, mm. like station nuclear weapons in Britain so that we would deter the, the Soviet Union, mm. um, she did. Mm. You know, she, nobody really thought Mrs Thatcher span, spun and, and, and deviated. They knew she was a conviction politician. And I think she'd be, uh, she'd be appalled, really, that the Conservative Party has been so weak mm. in delivery over the last three years. Have you been watching the programme about her, the BBC documentary? Yeah, well, we're, I'm not, not sure how, how often we're allowed to say good things about the BBC. Well, no, 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 no. But I think it's... We've a already said about this programme, I think it, it seems to be remarkably even-handed, actually. Yeah, good. Well, I, I think it's a superb documentary, mm. yeah, and with the archive material. Have you been, have yes, you've so been enjoying it? I, I have indeed, and I think it's beautifully done as mm. well as anything. But I think you mentioned that, I mean, we discussed this, I remember, a long time ago, that Thatcher, you know, one admires her, but it was largely an economic thing, wasn't it, Thatcherism, yes. that so much of what has you know, united people on the centre-right or the right, call it what you want, have been cultural issues, I would say. Mm -hmm. And I think that, wouldn't you say that Thatcher in a way wasn't that interested in those particular areas? I mean, or rather maybe they weren't compelling areas at the time. I think every Prime Minister has to be judged in the context of their times. And in the end of the 1970s, before she came to power, uh, the question really wasn't so much how Britain should be governed, but whether Britain could be governed at all. You know, the trade mm -hmm. unions were largely yeah. in charge. Um, there were three-day weeks in the 1970s. There was a whole sense of Britain being in decline and ungovernable. Strikes, industrial decline. Uh, we, were, we were a nation, really, with a massive identity crisis and a huge brain drain. You know, some of the most talented people um, in our country were going abroad because they were giving up on Britain. London mm. was quite a grey, down-at-heel place. Mm -hmm. uh, and Mrs Thatcher came in to, and she fundamentally changed that. That was the great success of her time. And, and she did it by restoring the authority of government. Mm. And she did it by rewarding those people who made good decisions. Mm. And so suddenly talent and investment started flowing into the country again. Mm. And, she, and still we benefit today from the fact that Britain is the leading place for inward investment. Mm. She mm. took lots of brave decisions um, in that regard. But I think she would have probably had different emphases today because mm. we have different challenges today. Mm. Mm. And I, I think it shouldn't be forgotten that um, she never cut the police. Mm. She regarded law and order as a fundamental conservative responsibility. Um, and of course, she retook the Falkland Islands. Mm. She, she understood the importance of sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And of course, later on in her, in her years, she, she made the famous Bruges speech, where I think she realized that some of the decisions that she had been part of in Britain's relationship with the European Union were wrong. And we had stopped being part of a European economic 
community yeah, yeah, and yeah. we're becoming part of the European Union which was moving nation states into ever closer relationship with with each other so um, some of the people who call themselves Thatcherites today I think have a narrow memory of her right, right and I don't think yeah. I'm not sure she would be one of today's Thatcherites right right you mean by that the absolute sort of evangelical free marketeers you know like the people who that for, for, that is all that it's about yeah. for them but yeah. it's, it's entirely about the market and yeah. profit you're saying she wouldn't go for that yeah and I think there's an idea today of the individual that I think exists in some more libertarian mm. conservative circles where that individual isn't really connected to the public services mm. that supported them in early in their life and still support yeah. them that's cut off from family church community I, I, I'm, a, I'm a Christian and uh, for me, Catholic social teaching gets the idea of the individual right. Mm. It's an idea of a person deeply connected to mm. other people. Mm. They, are in, they are in charge of their own life. They are um, they're free to uh, choose uh, key aspects of uh, how they live. But they are not cut adrift from their nation's culture, mm. Mm. its history, uh, loved ones. Mm. Uh, and they... And they they can't build things on their own, whether it's a business or a good life. There is certain things that government provides and history provides and culture provides. And I think there needs to be a recovery in conservatism of that broad understanding of what it means to be an adult citizen in a civilized country. How do we civilize young people so that they understand that Western civilization can't be taken for granted? This is a project mm. which every generation needs to reinvest in. I mean. What you were describing there, I would say, is what David Goodhart called the somewheres. Yeah. Simple. I mean, we're somewheres, are we not, Tim? Both of us? Yeah, I hope so. You know, no, but the, but the thing is, is that where well, I would disagree, he's actually going to be coming on the show shortly, David Goodhart. Mm. Um, he talked very much about the uh, uneducated being somewheres, you know, and all the rest of it. And this, is, this was one of the kind of criticisms during the Brexit campaign. But of course, there are people who are educated to the gills who are somewheres as well, you know, yeah. have a very strong sense of that. Um, you mentioned the law and order. Uh, growing up, I'm sure like you, you know, the Tory party, almost to the point of being mockable, was the party of law and order. Mm. The hang them and flog them, perhaps. Hang them and flog them. Yeah. Um, I would say that that perception, even publicly, has entirely gone. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Um, you know, whether it's Theresa May cutting the police or whatever it is. But just generally, I'd say, isn't it deeper than that, Sam? I mean, in the sense that... It's a very big question I'm asking you, but in a way, how conservative at the moment is the Conservative Party, really? Well, Estimate Vey, one of the um, leadership candidates already eliminated, had the, the best slogan, I think, of the campaign, even yeah. if she didn't have the best campaign, yeah. and that was make the Conservative Party conservative right. again. And I think one of the downsides of the Theresa May period was some of the candidates that she's Select, she allowed to be selected and have become MPs. Mm. They strike me as people who are largely in politics for career reasons, yeah. not with any great sense of belief. Mm. Um, the system of special advisors uh, that exists around ministers, these are people that allow the ministers have some sort of political appointees around them to sort of ensure that the political agenda is driven through a civil service that might not be so understanding or sympathetic. I it. think we've seen that, haven't we, recently? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we certainly have. Yeah. Um, but I meet lots of these special advisors, mm. and none of them haven't got. A, they, most of them haven't got a first idea of mm. what Margaret Thatcher stood for. Mm. The vast majority. Cause I, I ask them deliberately. I go through my little checklist of questions. I ask them how they voted in the referendum. They nearly all voted for Remain. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so you you have this political class mm. uh, at the who, which has far too much control over the modern. Conservative Party and frankly electing a new leader is only the beginning of what needs mm. to happen in the Conservative Party we need a huge clear out of a lot of the uh, individuals that have power at the moment and a rediscovery of uh, uh, you know St Reagan used to say you know staff is policy yeah and yeah, if yeah. you don't have good people throughout an institution it's hard to make it work mm. uh, properly uh, and I think you see in public appointments, uh, a whole range of public bodies 
uh, when Labour are in power, they stuff these institutions yes, exactly, yeah. with Labour people. Mm -hmm. When we're in power, we stuff these people with Labour people. You know, um, and well, this I think is why the, the sort of general drift of society often appears leftward, regardless of who's in. Yeah. If you say, well, but, you know, you've got a Conservative government, or you've got a this or that. Actually, no. It's, it's all the quang. It's the establishment that's been basically established, which is essentially. Soft left, yeah. which is why I hate, hated your introduction. Well, <laughs> worried about your introduction, saying I was at the heart of the political establishment because the establishment in our country at the moment is not one that I think is supportive of conservative values. Mm. I'm only you have been at the, at the heart in many different <laughs> ways, writing speeches and what have you. No, yeah. I, I know I'm only teasing. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I said, why? Has it never really occurred to you to want to stand to, as a, for office? Um, well, I, 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 one of the organisations I also used to, to run was the Conservative Christian Fellowship. Yes, I was going to ask you about mm. that. Though. And um, I had people constantly coming to me and saying uh, they've been called by God to be in Parliament. Yeah. You know, and, you know, as a lot of how Christians talk. And I felt one of my principal jobs was to discourage them. And if they still wanted to do it at the end of all the things that I said to them, well, Fair enough, but mm. I've seen the, 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 it's the institution just over the road, Peter, the House of Commons, mm. is probably has the worst divorce and marriage breakup mm. rate mm. of almost any institution mm. in the country. Mm. It's uh, people are separated from their families during the week, lots of alcohol, lots of young people. It's a it's a family wrecking uh, lifestyle yeah. unless you your your relationship is really built on rock. Mm. Lots of people. Have, expend enormous amounts of money trying to get a seat, mm. then they don't win the seat, then they get into Parliament and they find that they never become the minister in the department mm. of the area that they want. I think I, I, I applaud people who go into public life, but I think it's important for people to go in with their eyes open mm. and how hard it is to necessarily make progress uh, in the way that they perhaps would like. And I've just felt that writing, advocating, mm. Mm. Uh, policy work that I've been doing has been a better use of my time. And you can have frankly. actually more power, can't you, than being a backbench MP? Actually, sometimes I think you, mm. I think you can. And um, uh, I don't want to be to be negative. We mm. need good people in public life. My goodness, we need good people in mm. public life. But I think there are many ways to serve, and I think people need to go into politics with their eyes open as to the uh, as to how difficult it is mm. to, to to make progress. You mentioned the the, um, the Christian Association, Conservative mm. Christian Association. That's right. Fellowship, yeah. Fellowship. Um, how much is how much is your faith? And you're a man of strong faith. How mm. much how much has that informed your political views? Do you think um, a great deal? And I became a Christian at sixteen. A few years after, I why, became why a, did cons you, why did a conservative. What, what what? It, I went to a, an event with the Baptist minister. Mm and they talked about Jesus Christ and really used the line of C.S. Lewis mm -hmm. and said that um, at some point everybody has to examine the claims that this man makes. He said he was the son of God and he was either mad, bad, or he was who he said he was. Mm -hmm. And I spent a lot of time reading and I came to the conclusion that he was the son of God. And I think through most of my 20s and 30s, I had a very evangelical, some would say almost fundamentalist view mm. of scripture. I think over the years I've become uh, more liberal on certain things. I think more willing to accept that other people have perspectives on religion and faith and divinity that uh, I need to be more respectful of. And I think in conversations you and I have mm. had, Peter, over the years, mm. uh, for example, I've changed on home, views on homosexuality. Mm. You know, I, I took a very traditionist view on those issues and I don't anymore. And, uh, faced with all sorts of realities. Um, but uh, I initially, when I became a Christian, I thought I should walk away from politics and th that I, sh that I you know, considered the ministry uh, and, and, and things. But it was William Wilberforce who probably, is, if I had to name a He's a great hero of yours. He really is. Yeah, he, yeah. He's the guy, obviously, well known for uh, fighting slavery, mm. but he abolished the last lottery that Britain had. He formed the RSPCA. He was involved in so many good causes. Mm. And 
he had that quality, which I think is the most important quality that anyone should bring to public life, which is perseverance. Mm -hmm. uh, any good project is worth sticking at. And he, mm -hmm. he stuck at the, trying to fight the slave trade for over four decades. Mm -hmm. you know, it, was a, it was a life work. And um, he, it was John Newton, uh, the, 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 the author of Amazing Grace, who mm. convinced him, yes, you've become a Christian, but don't walk away from public life. Mm. We need good people in public life. And uh, that's why I sort of have stayed in politics. And, the, and you decided, well. but you got really quite near to maybe take, taking holy orders, as it were. I don't think I got near to it, but it was, a, it was a thought at the front of my mind for a good number of years, that that one route I probably would, would we wanted to consider going down. It's interesting because uh, uh, you're talking about your faith because um, apparently the number of people who have traditionally gone into politics, MPs, whatever, mm. the, the number that would consider themselves to be religious is actually hugely disproportionate to the population. I mean, there are mm. many more people. Yeah, there is this link, isn't there, between yep. religion and uh, and public service? Yeah. Still, I think so, and um, I think there is an attempt at the moment to uh, push Christians out of. Mm, public mm, life. Mm. Um, I think Tim Farron, the former Liberal Democrat leader, faced a lot of that. Here was someone who uh, did think that um, homosexuality was legal, should remain legal, mm. that abortion was legal and should remain legal. But that wasn't enough. People wanted to know what his private beliefs on these issues mm. were. And if his private beliefs didn't quite measure up to what people thought they should be, mm. he shouldn't be in public life. And I think that's a dangerous view to start peering into people's souls and having to know everything that they, they think about everything. Because mm. if you look over the years, whether it's the slave trade or Martin Luther King Jr. on the civil rights movement, uh, debt forgiveness in the third world um, in, the, in the run up to two, the year 2000, again and again, I think Christians have been a f largely a force for good in public life and I think um, our, I think our civilization is based on Judeo-Christian mm. ethics and I think we're poorer uh, without that influence yes. in, in our national conversations. Uh, it certainly has, it, it is. I think it's not, not just actually, you talk about Christianity, but I think isn't there a general narrowing as well of actually, you know, what is acceptable for a public figure? I mean, do you, you hear this more and more that actually that people of real quality maybe won't want to go into public life mm. or be MPs because they're going to have everything that they've ever said or yeah. ever thought. There's no allowance for nuance. There's no allowance for anything changing. They, yeah. it's, it's going to be examined and dragged up. Why would you put yourself through it? Why indeed? Yeah. 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 Um, and a intolerance for allowing people to evolve mm -hmm. as well. Um, and the entrenchment of people at the moment in in positions that they've held for years mm -hmm. is one of the most unsatisfying parts of mm -hmm. public policy at the moment. You know, we are living in a time when uh, we're seeing technological, cultural, mm -hmm. economic and social change of an, ex of an extraordinary pace. And I think it's Matt Ridley talks about ideas mm -hmm. having sex with each other. <laughs> and I think these trends are having sex yeah, with yeah, each other. Yeah, you know, yeah, trends yeah. are influencing, accelerating each other. Mm -hmm. And you have events like 2016 with the EU referendum, the election of Donald Trump, and uh, three year, unpredicted events. Mm -hmm. And yet, the Financial Times, The Guardian, most politicians, central banks, as far as I can tell, they all seem to think exactly the same mm -hmm. as they did before these events occurred. Exactly. Or before no these trends struck. Mm -hmm. Now, I think there should be an encouragement in public life mm -hmm. for everyone to sit down in a conversation mm -hmm. like this and to say tell us what tell us why how your ideas have evolved mm. and if someone like you know Jeremy Corbyn who seems to believe exactly what he did today as he did in the, the early mm. 80s before communism collapsed I think those sort of people should be ruled out from public office I want people who are <laughs> open-minded and, uh, and and fresh thinking and willing to admit mistakes whether we could develop a culture that allows that I don't know but it would be a huge improvement on the staleness we have now. I think it's interesting that if you're left and you believe the same thing, you're principled. <laughs> if you're on the right and you believe the same thing, you're a bigot and a reactionary. <laughs> of course. Uh, Tim, thank you so much for coming in and talking. I, you're probably back off to Salisbury, are you not this weekend, or, 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 or staying up in London? Well, actually, I'm at Windsor Castle. Oh, really? This weekend, not to see the Queen, but oh. actually um, on a conference on Christian responsibility in public oh, right. affairs. So 
Well, um, look, thank you very much, Tim. It's great, great to talk to you. Um, that's it for so what you're saying is. So please remember to subscribe if you haven't already, and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much.